morning friends let me just get my gloves back on here okay it's below freezing and it's cold here the weatherman said we were going to have snow but um, yeah we've still got cold mud <clears throat> so let me ask you a question who is the packer in your family I mean the person who's the expert in organizing things to achieve maximum utilization of space and to minimize the risk of damage to the contents of things like boxes or suitcases or the back of cars. Well, in our family, that's me. Yep. When we go on trips, I pack my suitcase and Vivian packs hers. And then I go back and repack hers to make sure that all the space has been utilized and things aren't going to get broken. And usually she can put more stuff in. It works, okay? Over the years, I've learned to how to pack shampoos so they don't leak, uh, how to wrap fragile objects in clothing so that they don't get damaged, how to put heavier items at the bottom of the suitcase so it's not top heavy when you're pushing it through the the uh, lines at the these uh, airport but there's one thing I am not responsible for that is money when we travel I would be perfectly happy to have just a few bills in my pocket to pay tips or to use in vending machines. Vivian? Vivian's constant refrain is, but what if they won't accept plastic? What if they ask for real money? She wants cold, hard cash. To which I reply, what makes, makes your money any more real than my plastic? economics. Okay, it's a mystery to most of us, but in es essence economics describes how people exchange goods and services. The simplest form is barter. Early in my career I took care of a farmer's wife. I don't remember what the problem was, but at the end of the visit, he confessed that they were strapped for cash, and he offered to pay me in chickens. Now, this was something that was new to me, okay? But, and as a vegetarian, uh, who I, we do eat some eggs, and when the mention of chickens came in, I thought, you know, Oh my goodness, a chicken coop in the backyard. My children can learn some responsibility. My wife can have fresh eggs. I started getting excited about it. And I, I suggested um, two chickens. I had no idea how many chickens to ask for. How many chickens is a doctor's visit worth? I asked for two chickens. And the farmer laughed and he said, Doc, you must think that my my chickens are prize winners. They're just common old chickens. And he suggested five chickens, which was fine with me. I didn't have a clue what was going on. But I had these visions of fresh eggs for my wife and an experience for my children. Then the chickens arrived. And they had already been plucked and were ready to pop in the oven or whatever you do with chickens. <laughs> I, <laughs> I just laughed, okay? I mean, what, what, what else could I do? I gave the chickens to some of my staff and I realized that I didn't have a clue how to function in a barter economy. <clears throat> barter economy works fine at a local level, okay? But it's a cumbersome system if you want to purchase goods that are from far away. Imagine trying to pack enough chickens to, pa to pay for gas and food and hotels for a trip to Florida, much less paying for entrance to Disney World or buying a box of oranges. Okay, hauling that many chickens 
gets around could really be difficult. Enter money. Money originally consisted of things that were rare and therefore deemed more valuable, gold, jewels, and the like. Marco Polo tells of how he and his uncles returned from their trip to China, and everybody thought they were bears. Everybody thought they had totally failed. Everybody was sorry for them or delighted in their misery until they had a family gathering and they ripped out the seams on their coats and out spilled bags of gold and piles of jewels. Traveling to China, they had had to transport their goods in these big packs. Coming back, they converted all of their goods to gold and jewels. Gold and jewels are portable, but they don't have a consistent value. Gold is not gold. It's always mixed with something else. So gold had to be weighed. It had to be assayed to find, find out how pure it was. Jewels had to be sized. They had to be kept for flaws and graded. So governments began taking gold and silver and stamping it, in, it into coins that had a consistent weight. And for the first time, value of goods could be measured in specific units. The familiar dollars or euros or whatever form of currency you have in your part of the world. When you introduce money into a barter economy, you end up with a haggle economy. That's a Steve term, I know, okay? But a haggle economy has no fixed prices, has money, so everything is in units. There are no fixed prices. It's The price is still based on how much do you want what I have and how much am I willing to accept for what you, from you. At a local level, this works pretty well because relationships moderate the haggling. But step outside the local area and things can get pretty dicey. When my family lived in Nigeria in 2000, okay, uh, the local market only had vegetables that were grown locally, which meant that in season we had tomatoes and another season we had another vegetable. But in the, the, the state capital, several miles away, 30 miles away, okay, there was a shop that specialized in importing vegetables from other parts of the country. And so they had a lot larger diversity of vegetables. And we Westerners who are used to eating the same vegetables, Every week you go to the store and there's always broccoli, there's always cucumbers, there's always tomatoes, and we're used to eating that way. So we got used to buying at this shop that imported the vegetables. And one day one of my African friends, my Nigerian friends, came with me and he was just shocked when we bought tomatoes. He said, that's not what tomatoes cost. No, that's not what tomatoes cost in season, but these were imported from another part of the country where they were growing in season. And he tried to haggle the price to get it down to what he thought it was appropriate and was told, no, this is the price. And finally, in frustration, he just threw up his hands and he walked away and he, he said to me, you must just like being cheated. Okay, when you step outside the local setting, Haggle economy can get dicey. Still, it has advantages over bartering. Now, instead of chickens, all you have to carry is money. Now, the original money was gold and silver, remember? Stamped into unit-sized coins. <clears throat> that would work for short journeys. But what if you were doing businesses and needed a lot of money to purchase a lot of goods at the other end of your trip? Your suitcase could very easily exceed the weight limits of your flight. And what if the coins you carried from home 
were not accepted in the country where you wanted to buy the goods. All of this created problems, and so about 600 years ago, two things happened in Europe that transformed economics. First, governments began issuing paper money that represented the gold and silver. It was much lighter and easier to carry. The second thing was that private entities, banks, big trading networks, began using debt instruments. A piece of paper that told, said, you, you own this much money. One of the largest trading networks in Europe was the Hanseatic League in northern Germany. This was around the time of Columbus. Okay? It was centered in the town of Lubbock. Uh, means nothing to us Americans, but it's a major German town on the Baltic Sea right below Denmark. And it controlled the trade on the Baltic Sea flowing from Russia and Eastern Europe along the Baltic coast and on to England and France. Merchants could deposit money in one office of this trading network, say in Poland, travel to England, present their receipt, and collect the same amount of money. Now, to keep the accounting consistent, because different money was used in Poland than in England, to keep the accounting consistent, all of the accounts were measured in the money of Lubbock, the Marx Lubbock. And Marx Lubbock became the, the standard uh, currency of trade throughout a large portion of Europe. It was the real money that was accepted everywhere. In fact, today in the UK, in the United Kingdom, the term lubbish means something that is real, the real deal, the real thing. And that, my dear friends, is where your money and your cash and your money orders and your checks and your plastic credit cards and debit cards, all of that came from lubbish. Now, I stumbled down this rabbit hole while trying to understand the difference between real and genuine. What is the difference between something that is real and the something that is genuine? I know, it's a question that nobody in their sane mind would ask. Okay? Well, a thousand years ago, English, the language, was in a major crisis because England, the country, had just been conquered by the French. The Norman French had killed the English king, king and taken over the country and any of you have, who have watched Robin Hood know, know how the Normans came in, the Frenchmen came in, and they, they weren't nice. In fact, to do business in the king's court, you had to speak French, which almost no Englishman did. You had to speak French, and since the king's court was the court of the land, there was no, was no law other than the king's word. If you had legal problems, you had to speak French. Now, churchmen had always used Latin because the books they had inherited, the Bible, the writings of the church fathers, had been written in Latin, and so the church continued using Latin, which left the uneducated people, the farmers, the day workers, the laborers, speaking English, but not being able to talk about these other subjects. So the English language went through a major upheaval during this time period with, with because anybody who wanted to get anything done or who wanted to be somebody had to speak English, French, and Latin which is why our educational system, until just the last 50 years or so, uh, included classes in Latin and French as a standard part of the education. A thousand years later, and we're still learning three languages, because that's what English 
is. These three languages mashed together in, in this incomprehensible heap. Real and genuine were two of the words that flooded into the English language during this period of time. Real derives from the Latin res, which meant things. And in, as the French adopted this, okay, first it shows up in theological writings in France and then in England, and it denoted something that actually exists, a thing, as opposed to something that was imaginary. That happened in the 1400s, about Columbus this time. A hundred years later, a second usage for real came in, and this time it was through the legal system. When, when uh, lawyers were writing up wills or dealing with the estate of dead people, they distinguished between real assets, which were immovable, land, houses, and the like, real assets, and personal assets, which were movable. Okay, furniture, tools, okay. <clears throat> it wasn't until the 1800s that another sense was added on to this of something being real as opposed to fake or artificial. Today we use all of these meanings without even really thinking about it. We talk about things as being real versus imaginary. We tell kids, the monster under the bed isn't real. You're just imagining it. Okay? We talk about real versus fake. We see a beautiful woman and we wonder what parts of her are real versus fake. And if you ask a lawyer to draw up a will, he's going to use the terms real and personal property because that's still a part of our legal system. And all of us understand what real estate is, which comes from that same legal terminology. Genuine entered the language uh, from Latin also, and it's part of a cluster of a, a, a whole bunch of words. Genus, congenital, gender, gene genealogy, all of which are connected by the idea of birth or descent. Something that is genuine is something that really descended from its reputed source. It's not an imposter. Or in the British dialect, it is lubbish. So, is your church real? Is it genuine? Is it lubbish? To my perspective, and this is just Steve, to my perspective, a lubbish church is one that is true to its roots, both in belief and practice. Not just the church, but its members. The Bible speaks of Jesus as being the author and finisher of our faith. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In him is no shadow of turning. He is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. A church that teaches that the apostles, or the church, or an angel from heaven, changed what God expects of us, it seems to me to be denying essence of the gospel. But Christians can get, really get tied up in trying to rediscover the original, the real church. And they forget that Jesus was also the author of grace and mercy. He told the religious people in his days that it's important to know the rules and to keep them to be real, but it's more important to have this grace and mercy in your life, to live a life of compassion rather than judgment, 
this is reflected in our lives. That we will have entered into the economy of heaven. That we will truly be lubbish. That our churches will truly be lubbish. And where our treasure is, our hearts will be also. And that will make packing for heaven a snap. Stay warm, my friends. I am going to quickly retreat to the house and uh, probably crawl under the covers to get warmed up.